Okay, so we've got uh, Dominic Ventura with us today from Fourth Access Designs. And uh, Dominic's going to, uh, actually Dominic's background is uh, in jewelry design, classic jewelry design. Plus uh, he uh, also does a lot of digital design uh, using Rhino, ZBrush, uh, and uh, has some great workflows that he's going to share with us today. Plus uh, he also does some installations for Elux 3D. Uh, jewelry scanners. He was really one of the pioneers in 3D scanning and learning how to utilize uh, scan data uh, in jewelry design. So Dominic's going to share some uh, some projects with us today. Uh, go ahead, Dominic. Take it away. Thanks, Chris. So um, what I want to demonstrate today are two projects. Uh, one project will be uh, a automobile. It's it's going to be a 1970 Ford Mustang Boss that was recreated. So, uh, and then there's another project which is going to be uh, ZBrush and, uh, and Rhino, a combination of those two. So the first one is strictly Rhino. And um, so the, the request on this project was from a customer down in Alabama. Uh, Barch and Clay is the uh, retail store. Their customer has an 88 car museum and this 1970 Mustang is one of the uh, cars in the collection. So they, their request was that they wanted this to be a pendant and a tabletop display. Uh, so what we did here was we scanned the car in. It was a, uh, I was sent a three and a half inch um, die cast car, basically. And then that car, I'm going to show you some images now of, of the, the car itself. So now uh, this, is the, um, this is the car taken apart. There's another image of it. Now, I, I, I took it apart further, took the axles and the wheels off. Uh, the doors are off, but we decided that in order to make the project a little more uh, uh, not as complicated, we are not going to have the hood and the doors open. So what I did was I glued them in place and then uh, prepped them, painted all the parts. And then this, these are the 3D scans from that, all the parts. That's, that's, pretty, cool. that's pretty cool right there. So you can see, and then this was on a 1.3 megapixel. I think it did a great job. So now with the new uh, 2 megapixel, uh, the resolution is going to be even better. And this was the uh, dashboard, and this is the, uh, the seats. Right. Uh, this is the cast pieces that were, were uh, cast, and I'll, we can look at that later on, but I'd like to go in and show you a little bit more about the car right now. So I'm just going to move this uh, out of the way to another monitor here, and we can start. So... Um, what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to take and um, shade things in for you. We've got a little bit of an auto save here, so you've got to give a little time to cycle around before we can uh, do something. So I'm going to just grab all the parts of the car, and we're going to just shade them in so you can see what they look like. So are those scans then on layers or... Uh Yes, they are. I, they are on layers, uh, but you know, right now they're just together. What I, I did was I, I positioned them. So I'm going to show you the car uh, exploded, and the um, the mesh exploded. So it's going to take a little time to catch up here. There's a lot of data that uh, we're opening up. So here we go. So the one on the left are all the scans, individual scans that were put in their relative positions. And the one on the, on the right is the uh, the rebuilt car. Very so, nice. So I'm going to bring in a, uh, a, a clipping plane here. And I'm just going to slide this across. So you can see, you can see the cross section of the car and all the parts, relative parts to that. So now there is a car underneath this one. So, um, I, I superimposed and built over the other car. It's hidden, uh, you know, it's hidden on the uh, the hide uh, function here. But in the meantime, I just want to show you the, you know, the, the car, and I also want to go a little bit over the technique for rebuilding this. So I'm going to okay. take this back to, uh, let's put it back in the assembled uh, section here. So it looks as if you're you're going to be using the scans then as a template to. Correct, correct. 
So one of the things in Rhino is that, you know, you, you want to snap the vertices. This is a mesh, don't forget. So Rhino is a NURBS modeler, but there are some tools in here to process meshes and to also use the geometry, uh, you know, in a, in a more, uh, in an easy way to uh, snap the thing. So we have different snaps here, but the vertex snap is the one that we really want to use. So I'm going to take off the, uh, right there. So if, if I... Take, I'm going to just move this up a little bit for you, right there. Mm -hmm. So I cut I cut the body in half because I really want to work symmetrically. I didn't have to worry about doing it on both sides. So I just want to show you briefly uh, what you can do. I'm going to use an interpolated curve here. And I can just go and start snapping. Now, I've got to make sure the vertex is on. You say it was on back on the construction plane. So vertex is the command you want to use in order to snap to your meshes. Okay. So let's go back to interpolated curve, and I can now draw across the top of this and, and start. So each, each each click then is snapping directly onto that mesh. So yeah, Chris, we um, what we're doing here is we're snapping to the vertices. If you go and look at the car closely, you can see all the vertices that are making up that polygon mesh. So if I go back mm -hmm. to interpolated point here, now I can click on vertices. So that's what that that, um, that particular snap does. So, so the whole car was really done by just extracting a few curves off of it. But the, the main reason why the scan is useful is because we're really moving things to the shape of the car as we make surfaces. So that's the next thing I'd like to do for you. So I'm going to uh, bring this back down again. And I uh, previously had uh, made a, a few curves that uh, I'm going to bring back up here. So these curves were done by laying them out on the car itself, on the mesh, snapping the vertices. Mm -hmm. right? I actually copied a couple as, as well. So um, now if I go in and I'm going to loft these together, so let's loft this. So let's go in there and grab that curve and that curve, and we're going to just work our way down. To these curves here and we just have a normal normal loft so there's my first surface created now I can turn the control points I'm gonna lock I'm gonna lock these two surfaces here so now you can see the surface there and uh, I'm gonna turn the control points on all right so one of the things that I do a lot is I do a lot of control point modeling but I also make sure that in the process of doing it I create as few vertices as, as, as possible. And that's where you're going to have real control over this. So I can start to move control points. All right, so I just broke the history on that surface. Um, I can start bringing points out in this manner and to start sculpting with this. So, re so really, at the end of the day, when you have less control points, then you have more editability of what it looks like. Correct, correct. So now if I go back in, I'm going to uh, just grab those by accident. Let's bring those back. So now I can grab all the points here. Along. Now the other thing I can do too is I can you know, use the selection tools in order to grab those. So if I want to go across here and just grab that now in that direction. I also make shader as a shader. So if I go in here and I say shaded UV, now I know which is my, uh, which direction. Now, this is not, actually, this is not uh, um, working at this point because I don't have the colors, but um, I can show you on another file. So in my, my ISO curves are different colors, so I know when I want to select something, which way it's a U or the V direction. So if I go in here and say in the V direction this way, now I can go back in and I can start moving control points. Uh, I can add, okay, so I can add rows of control points. All right, so in here, I'll just do that and that. Now that's going to give me a little more detail in this. So again, SV, and now I can start to move this in, and I can start adding some, you know, starting to add detail and start to bring things in. So this this was really the foundation of doing the car. So very nice. Like, thanks, Chris. So what I like to do, well, you know, I'm going to take the car apart and just show you all the different components of it. Um, I'm going to hide the this card here just to make it easier to. Uh,
So this particular, this job was for a retailer, correct? Yes, correct. So a couple of things, you know, we built in, uh, so this was supposed to be a tabletop, but at the same time also be a pendant. So I also you know, put a, a bale in there, so the bale opens and closes. So that's the bale, which was hidden. That way, when they want, if they didn't want to wear this, they made a little uh, platform and a stand for it, spent a little time doing that. So they could have it on their desktop, or they can take it off and wear it as a pendant. So cool. I'm, going to, I'm going to explode this. So here's all my parts. There are 13 parts of the car. And all, most of it's control point model. There are single surfaces in a lot of this. And again, it was done uh, by using the parts themselves in order to get uh, core curves in this. So I'll, I'll just deconstruct a few things for you. We have here a, uh, this is the nose of the car, or the hood. So I'm just then trimming everything. So the, the thing about this is that all these radiuses on here were done through control point modeling and they're not radiuses. So this is one surface. So if I turn the control points on for this guy, you can see where I have a lot of control over that surface and being able to add, make changes and add changes to it. Very nice. So you can make a nice cal induction hood if you wanted to. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so each one of these, each one of the parts was, was done and made, um, and, and then the 3d printed. So I'll bring in, um, I'll show you the, uh, so I, I screw everything for the caster. So this was the, uh, this was the, uh, the sheet for that with all the parts. And then I also had another sheet for another set of parts on the car. So this goes to the caster specifying what metals. And this is in the works. So the jeweler who put this together, Patrick, was a great guy. Uh, we opted to leave some details out. So he put in the, um, the pipes underneath the car, the steering wheel he made, uh, the shifter. So, you know, what was going to be reasonable in terms of me modeling and him adding a little more detail by hand. Uh, he added all the, uh, the, the uh, puffing in the seats, you know, um, and in, in the nice. rear seats, yeah. And then I'll show you the uh, the finished car. So this was uh, okay. So the car initially was a three and a half inch die cast car, and then I reduced the two inches. And remember, you you know, in addition to having to model the car, we have to sh I had to shell this out as well. So everything had to have a thickness to it. So you're actually building you know, two cars: an inside car and an outside car, so to speak. So that's the uh, the finish. Yeah. And uh, the white gold was. Um, I'm sorry, Chris. What was the metal? Uh, Twenty or I mean, uh, eighteen carat or yeah, it was eighteen. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. So it was eighteen carat yellow gold, and then there was white gold for the parts that were um, um, rhodium, uh, black rhodium. So he put okay. the door, he put the door handles on. He put the um, the windshield wipers, the shifter, the steering wheel. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it was it was a nice project. It was a lot of work, a huge amount of work, uh, because anybody who's a car aficionado wants to make sure that all the details are there, and that's the underside of the car with the, the plaque on it. Do you, do you think? Uh, I mean, looking at what you did there, so basically the die cast uh, car was your model to start with, and you were able to use the scanning, the Elux 3D scanner, to uh, scan those parts. Uh, do the reverse engineering, scale it down, kind of add what you wanted, take away what you wanted, and then there you go. That's your you know, came up Correct. finished product. Correct. I mean, anybody who, anybody who it, it would, have been, would have been hard to do without, I guess. Yeah, I mean, anybody, anybody who builds a car and does it off plans, I, I you know, I, I say that they are they're really, you know, it's a hard thing to do. So the idea that having the car in there meant that I can really sculpt to the car rather than just making approximations and really spending a lot of time contemplating. So if I, let me bring this back down again. Um, and uh, I'll show you the car underneath this. So I'll just take a couple of parts out. So we're, what we're doing right now is we're going to the hidden car the car beneath the car the car beneath the car there you go so that car there was the one that i used 
to help construct it. And, uh, you know, the parts were on different layers. I could turn them on or turn them off a, a, as necessary. Um, the, the, the most important thing for me was, was having that, that information there. And that made a huge difference on, on uh, you know, the, the final outcome. So uh, that's the finished car, Chris. I think it was a really uh, great project. Uh, they were very, very happy with the results. And, uh, you know, I think it really showed how scanning can really make a difference in, in capturing a, a part and, and recreating it. Uh, and in this case, you know, we went from a three and a half inch car to a, to a two inch car. And, uh, you know, keep in mind that, you know, all the details on this, we, we also have to think about, you know, the scale of, of it. So the, the uh, shut lines on the car are only, you know, three tenths of a millimeter. So, you know, there's a lot of thinking time in this as well, even, even though you have that three dimensional information to know how to, you know, take it from a, you know, bring it down to 30%, 35%. And make sure that you know it's manufacturable at that point. Uh, but absolutely. Yeah, but it, it was it was a very very good project, and, and I was very happy to, uh, to to be involved in it. So um, I'd like to go on to the next project. So Chris, the next project I want to show is a project that uh, was done for a company uh, named Alex Streeter, and Alex's jewelry is is unique. Um, he carves everything by hand, and this is a ring that was made almost 30 years ago. Uh, this was the, uh, the angel heart ring. So if you look here, you can see the, uh, it was actually from the movie, movie Angel Heart. So uh, the, this particular project, what I really want to show on this project is a combination of using Rhino and ZBrush in, for the workflow. So uh, I'm just, it's auto saving again. We got to give a couple of seconds here to catch up, fortunately. And there we go. So this is the, um, this is the ring right here. So this was a production set, which means I had to go from, you know, give them the sizes. They do a lot of business in Japan. And so these are all the rings there with their, um, their finger sizes. So I'm going to go in and zoom in on this one here. Now, this is the original scan that they gave me. Now, this came from an old mold. Um, they shot a wax. They cast it in silver. And they gave it to me to uh, to scan. Now, this is a real mess. You know, this is an old mold. We have parting lines in here. You can look at the bezel. There's a lot of distortion. So obviously, this was not ready for prime time at this point. And, you, can, uh, you can definitely tell it was a hand carved piece. Right, right. Well, Alex's stuff does look, you know, handmade. I mean, that's a hot. You know, his style is 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 you know is not. Uh, I didn't want to say refined because the refinement in his jewelry, but um, you know, his hand is his hand, and, and people like his style. So Yeah, I, I should probably clarify that. I don't mean that in a real derogatory way, I guess. <laughs> right. When you look at it on the screen, you can you can definitely see that it was done by hand. Sure, sure. But don't forget, this is just, this. you know, this is an old mold, so it, does, it doesn't do it any justice at the same time. So the request on this one was to recreate this in all the finger sizes, and really change very little on this as much as leave everything intact as much as possible. So, you know, discussions with their um, production manager and uh, you know, she's been working with him for years, uh, Rebecca. So she was the one who really guided the project as well and you know, gave me the insight as to you know, where we can change and, and what was important in terms of the, the manufacturing for her. So we took this in, um, I, I imported this as, as an OBJ. I usually save things out as OBJs. So let's undo that, Bring that back down to uh, where it belongs. What I did was I have a number of tools here. So the reason why I use Rhino interchangeably with ZBrush is because I want the accuracy. Although ZBrush, you can measure and you can, you know, it's still an approximation as far as I'm concerned. And especially on finger sizes for some companies, they want to make sure that they're, they're on the mark. So I do a lot of prep work here, especially when it comes to bezels or setting. So one thing I did, let me just hide that datum plane there. So now we have the, the finger size. We have the original scan. This is the rebuilt bezel. Right now I take all these at the same time and I bring them back into ZBrush. I export them and I bring them into ZBrush. So one thing I do in terms of my work environment, if you notice that my construction plane is only 50 by 50 millimeters. And the reason for this is because I, I want to use it as a reference. I don't care if we're going you know, to infinity or at least you know, 100 uh, millimeters or more in each direction. 
Uh, so it's important. It also tells, it gives me a sense of scale. So if something comes in that's not correct scale, it's an immediate visual um, reference to that that I know something's off. So now I take all this and I export it as, o as one OBJ. Now what I'm going to do is bring in a ZBrush over here and I'm going to show you the process of bringing it into ZBrush. So here we go. Okay. So now I'm going to just uh, turn off some uh, parts. Turn on and turn off some parts here. All right. So now that this is in ZBrush, you uh, you have the ability then to go in and do the sculpting and you basically yes. all the ZBrush tools. Correct, correct. So I'm just going to turn all these off, and I'm, you know, I want to get the, the raw ring in there. So there's the ring. Okay. Now what I did was I actually went in there and I knocked down the bezel just by, you know, you can I, I could have cut it in Rhino with that data plane, but in this case I think I just brought this in and just you know, just sculpted it down. So the first thing I have to do though is I have to make sure that I can I I get this down to the relative size. So now this is my um, my plug so to speak. All right. Now, that's the the finger size. that's eight and a half. Okay. So the first thing I did was I went in here and I actually used the brushes to pull everything in a little bit because I want to get this so that I want to be able to cut it through. So there is a little bit of, of sculpting work in here. So again, this is just just to get me a, a raw form and get it close to the finger size. All right. So that's the first thing that I do on this. And then, of course, I knocked the bezel off. So I'm just going to back off on that. Let's hide that part. And let's turn on this one here. And so there's my ring that's been, all the part, all the, the geometry has been sculpted in. And I moved everything to the center. I knocked down the bezel. You can see it's, I don't care how rough it is because that's going to be eliminated later on with once we start putting tools together. So... If I use live booleans on this, you can see where now you can see the finger size cut out there. Right. Now I have also a plug in the center. I'm going to turn off live booleans. You can see that was to trim out the inside of the bezel. I also have the bezel itself. Okay. And um, this is the logo. So the logo goes on the inside, so there's a logo. So now I'm going to turn off live booleans, and you're going to be able to see all the parts here that make this up. So the, the reason... Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, yeah, I was just looking. You got the two sets of booleans, one for the bezel and then one for the right um, finger size. Correct, correct. And also it was something to hollow it out as well. So once that once that's done, then I create one one mesh file that I can go back in and I make touch ups on the bezel, blend things together a little bit. Uh, if I turn off the finger size, you can see where the logo is sitting in there. So well, this the beauty, allows, the beauty of this is you're kind of getting you're still maintaining the integrity of the original and getting the precision of CAD. Correct, and then, that's why I do it. Right. I mean, you can, you certainly can do this all in ZBrush, but you know, to me, I think it's a little more cumbersome to do that. The other thing that's important too is that I also created that 50 millimeter environment within ZBrush as well, so that. And the reason why I use OBJs is because they go and clean in and out. So if I bring something in that's you know, uh, you know, 50 millimeters from Rhino, export that, I know it's going to be 15 millimeters in here. And so in, in now when I export this back out, I have the same advantage that I could bring it into Rhino, uh, which I, I did all these models and then, uh, you know, screw them and things. We'll go, we'll go back to that in a second. Um, but, you know, I, then I did all the finger sizes. So now here's another one. This is uh, another tool. This is what I also had to do, remember, is that I, I had to make sure that I kept the integrity of, of the, the faces and things like that. So there is a little distortion. So this one here was a, um, a size four. So it's a very, very small ring. So it is going to be a little distortion, but I couldn't, I had to do it individually. So I had to make sure the bezel maintained its integrity. I couldn't worry about distorting that. 
So I go in there, I make my changes on the shank itself, put the details in that I want, make the changes necessary, and then I go back in and I start adding my bezel. And uh, ex you know, I, I write this out. When you do a live Boolean, uh, you can write it out as, as a, another mesh, bring that back in, append it, and then I can go back in and, and put the finding details in. So this was done across uh, all the sizes. So if I go back to, uh, to Rhino here, let me just uh, bring this down to here. So I'm going to pull back out. And so here are all my sizes right here. That's going to take a second to catch up here. And there are my sizes. So the other thing I do is I, I, I label everything. So that way when they uh, when they make their molds, they know which, what's what. So I'll just hide some of the, the numbers here for you so you can, you can see. So this is size 6.5. It's a, it's a size 13 Japanese. This is 7.5. It's a size 15 Japanese. So again, I do my screwing in here, and you know that way I can, when I export out, I export them as an STL file at the end of the process. Very nice. So this is one of those projects where you know we've salvaged uh, uh, a ring that's very very popular, uh, but they were having production problems with this. So uh, by first of all, the setting was very difficult because the, the bezel was was you know falling apart at this point and, and way too thin. So now we're able to recreate the bezel, make changes on the shank that are necessary uh, in, in terms of the sizing of it, and add other details, you know, the sizes that, you know, hollow it out a little better. So, and, and the production now is, is much, much better. Everything goes together easily and they can get things out the door and not have to worry about repairing castings and filing off details because of parting lines or, or inconsistent waxes and geometry. So again, the, the, the scanning now, so this is, the first one was really using it in a CAD program. The, the second process going through a CAD program like Rhino and then bringing in the ZBrush means that now I can take advantage and extend the range of what that scanner can do in terms of uh, value. So now I can directly sculpt and edit on that mesh itself. And that made a huge difference for the customer in the end. And they're very happy with it. So uh, this is a good customer of mine, customer of mine, and uh, you know we've been doing work together for the, for the past year, year and a half. So they're very happy with the results, and and they're happy because they've captured the geometry of and the integrity of their pieces. And I and I and I know, you know, getting better at knowing what Alex finds important or they find important in terms of design, and and be able to keep that integrity with the, with the uh, the product. What's nice is uh, you're able to, um, and I think a lot of people kind of forget this sometimes, but when you do scan something, you know, the you're essentially bringing it in scale, so you don't have to think about measurements anymore, or bringing out a micrometer to try to, you know, measure and then try to build, you know, that just a, a not a very efficient way, whereas having that scan uh, and incorporating both uh, you know, programs with ZBrush for the sculpting and Rhino to, for the precision. It's just a, it's a game changer. Correct, correct. So I'll just show you the final the final ring. We'll turn off all these and we'll turn on the, the last uh, the last model here. So this is my model. The, um, the idea of sculpting directly on this is, uh, makes a huge difference for the customer uh, because they, they know that they don't have to worry about things changing, changing that much. So let me just turn off my uh, last, uh, turn that off. So this is the final ring right here. So this is the eight and a half and that's the final ring. So this was uh, exported as, a, uh, as an OBJ I also use DynaMesh a lot in here. I find that um, for most of the work that I'm doing, DynaMesh uh, really suffices. If I was doing more um, sculpting from the ground up, I probably would. I I'd probably use a more of a maybe a quad mesh or a native mesh in, in ZBrush. But the good news about ZBrush is that you have a mul multitude of ways of creating base meshes. In this case, you know we, we want to make sure that we, we keep that integrity. So. Um, so DynaMesh, and then from the DynaMesh, sometimes I, I uh, Z remesh it depending on the job, and then I write that out as an OBJ. 
once the OBJ is grown to, to uh, Rhino, then I'll export that and, uh, you know, uh, screw it up and export it as an STL. But OBJ... And then, are, are those being 3D printed then? Yeah, then we, they, for the 3D print them, um, you know, again, depends on the customer. In this case, the customer wanted, uh, you know, bumped up to 103%. It varies depending on what the customers wants and also the, the volume of your piece. You know, the, the more volume of wax, the more you're probably going to get shrinkage on it. Um, right. But it, it changed it changed the production line because they're able now to keep consistent with the product. You know, when, when you have a size 4 and a size 11 and everything in between, the product looks the same for the customer. And that's really important for, you know, for the integrity of design and, and keeping your customers as well. Nice work, Dominic. Uh, tell you what, I, I really, uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, today to go over a couple of these projects. And uh, like I mentioned um, earlier, you know, Dominic uh, is a consultant for the business, for the jewelry business, and uh, has customers all around the world. Uh, he was based out of New York for quite some time, so he does have a lot of customers in the New York City area, but he does uh, work for folks all around the United States and, and actually globally. So, um, you know, this uh, this particular project, uh, like I said, we've been trying to show some stuff that incorporates the latest 3D Helux 3D scanning technology and uh, how it would apply to just, you know, uh, real-world projects. And I uh, really appreciate what you've been able to show us today, Don. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, it was it's my pleasure, and uh, I hope this helps out uh, people out there. And if they're interested in, you know, learning more about this, I'd be more than happy to uh, to help them out. Um, I, 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 it's been a game changer for me, uh, the, the scanning technology, and it really captures the the, the CAD world uh, and and the sculpting world by having this this tool to be able to leverage the the data. And uh, there's a lot of uh, data caught up in, and, and trapped in the analog world. And this really makes a huge difference uh, as far as how you can take things that they might be projects that have been sitting there for a long time and all of a sudden they, they get a new life because you can actually do something with them in, in a more meaningful way. So my pleasure and uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the uh, presentation. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Dominic.